Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 358. Too many red blood cells are a side effect of testosterone therapy. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. What is erythrocytosis? Erythrocytosis is how I pronounce it, but there's other pronunciations. Oh, it's school in the South. We yeah, so put you're extra erythro. Vowels in. Yeah. <laughs> So erythrocytosis is um, the condition where you have too many red blood cells. And if you remember, red blood cells are the, are the cells in your blood that actually carry iron and carry oxygen. So they contain iron and they carry oxygen to all parts of your body. So that's very important. And you would think, well, what's, what's wrong with having too many? Because then I carry more oxygen. Right. But... The cells are part of the uh, volume of fluid that goes through goes through your blood, your veins, and your arteries. And when it you have too many cells in there, then it makes it thick. So thick blood is not good for you. Thick blood is uh, basically makes your heart work. Heart, excuse me, heart work um, with more difficulty. It has to push harder. It, it clogs up the, it, it's thick and it clogs just up thick. the veins it just and physic- If you think of physics, pushing a, a, a thick liquid uh-huh. is much harder than pushing a thin liquid. All right. So in general, it is less than half of the volume of your blood. So the other part of your blood is plasma. Plasma is that clear yellow fluid that uh, you can have red blood cells taken out of your plasma to look at different things in your blood by the lab. And it looks kind of like just straw-colored, clearish fluid. It's not as thin as water, but it's thinner than jello. So when you put these two together, you have to have a less than half of your blood should be cellular or red cells. So which part... The plasma part or the red blood cells part carries the hormones? The plasma part. Okay. The red cells just carry oxygen. So... So it's like a freight train and a passenger train. The freight train is carrying the iron and the oxygen. The real heavy stuff. And the passenger train is coming with the, the messages that operate everything. Right. Okay. That's right. That's right. So so one of the, the issues when we give testosterone is that some men genetically have higher uh, levels of red blood cells when their testosterone is high. So when we give them testosterone as pellets or shots or any other way of getting testosterone, then they make too many red blood cells and their blood gets thick. So these particular men, if they're genetically... It's not every man. Right. But if you if they have a total testosterone volume of X, they're going to have more red blood cells, period. Right. No matter what. Right. So if they have it because they're naturally generating it. Or if they have it because you've given it to them as a supplement. Right. To their natural Mm -hmm. amount. They're going to have thicker blood. It's a trigger. Um, Testosterone is a trigger for um, people to absorb more iron into their system. That's one thing. And it's also a trigger to the formation of red blood cells, more red blood cells, in your uh, bone marrow. So, so for so that two, subset two of the population, mm-hmm. it's a negative side effect to, to have testosterone. Yes, it's a negative side effect. So those are the patients that we have to be very careful with. If they really need testosterone to be healthy in other ways, right. then we have to find them, basically have to do a blood count, a CBC. We have to find those people and we have to follow them and treat them if necessary. So, so you don't give them a genetic test. You just uh-huh. do what's a, a CBC, which is a, a blood count, a blood, a red blood cell count. Red, red blood, blood cell count. We also look at white cells, but they don't have the volume that red cells have. Right. They're 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 more uh, infrequent. So we're just looking at the red cells, and that's really what the uh, testosterone does affect. It is 
it is based on the, the severity of the red cells and, or the, the level of the red cells in the blood is based on, on the dose of testosterone or the blood level of testosterone. So we can adjust this in many people and decrease their testosterone level. For, well, for instance, a lot of your male patients come in twice a year. Right. If, that, if, if I'm one of those people that has that genetic predisposition mm -hmm. and I come in twice a year and I get a uh, testosterone replacement, mm -hmm. then my red blood cell count may go up and then that exposes me to what kind of risks medically? Okay, so it's, it's, this isn't as much based on the fact that you're getting it twice a year. It's that when you get your testosterone twice a year, it goes up higher at the beginning Okay. Just so that it can last at a normal level. So if I get my testosterone, for instance, I, I could get it quarterly. Right. Instead of semi-annually. Yes. So if I got it quarterly, I get less volume of testosterone each time. Less dose. And, and that would have... put me at a, less of an increase uh, of the red blood cells. Yeah. The bump the bump isn't from the testosterone isn't as severe if you get the pellets more, uh, less often. So, so if I am genetically predisposed, once you've determined mm -hmm. that then in order for me to continue to get testosterone, which I need for other things, yes. I should get it less amount, but more frequent. Yes. Okay. That's one of the ways that we that you manage this so that it doesn't get too high. Yes. So then the next question was, what happens to you if it gets too high? Yeah. So, well, anything that causes strain on the, on the heart is not good for the heart. So that means your heart muscle is having to put out more energy to actually pump the blood that can lead to high blood pressure. It also can lead to heart disease. Does it make a difference between systolic and diastolic? I mean, I know one is the amount of flow control and the other is the amount of pressure in the blood vessel at all times. Well, systolic is, is the, when the heart muscle squeezes right. and pushes the blood, it has a higher pressure right. than when the valves close and the, and the chambers of the heart fill with blood, mm -hmm. then the blood pressure is lower, waiting for that next surge so, of so blood. So having the excess red blood cells doesn't, doesn't make a difference in the in diastolic. In the diastolic. Pressure. It's okay. going to make more of a difference in the systolic. In the systolic. Okay. But, so that's, that's one problem that we worry about. And there are certain levels of uh, hematocrit that we look at. Hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells that you have in your blood volume. So when we look at this, we look for anybody between 47% and 50%. When we get to in that level, we actually bleed them. We remove blood, do a phlebotomy, or if they're below 50%, they can actually give blood So uh, and donate it. Right, F full confession here. I am one of those mm -hmm. people that's genetically predisposed to this. Yes. And when I first came to see you to get pellets, mm -hmm. I was on a twice a year schedule. Yes. And as a result, you had to actually write a prescription. Once we determined that I had that surge of red blood cells, mm -hmm. you had to write a prescription for me to go to the Red Cross or some other blood donor center, mm -hmm. not to donate my blood, but to have it drawn out and thrown away. Right. So if the hematocrit is above 50%, then the, the Red Cross won't take it. They right. think there's something wrong with your blood. Now, honestly, I'm not sure why that would be. They would get more red blood cells right. and it would be helpful for someone who has blood loss. But there's, they're concerned that there might be something wrong with it. I'm not sure exactly what they couldn't tell me. So they don't take it and give it to someone else. Right. They will up to a hematocrit of 50%. So if you're a little bit I'm lower, under 50, then you I could, could donate, donate it. But if I'm over 50, I could donate, but they won't take it. But they won't take but it. But they so, will take it and throw it away. Right. If I write a prescription, they'll take it and take a unit of blood and then they throw it away. Well, and I found out, I mean, you got so frustrated with their system because mm -hmm. when you gave me that prescription, I just wandered down to the Red Cross. I said, here I am. Can you take out some blood? They're like, oh, oh, no, no, no. We have to schedule an appointment. We only do it on these days of the month. You have to come and in. And they were completely empty, right? Right. They, no there. one was there. Exactly. They could have done it right then. But no, because of all their technical qualifiers. Mm -hmm. And they had to uh, see my driver's license to make sure that I was me uh, <laughs> and take that blood and then throw it away. Right. But... I, it, 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 it doesn't really make a lot of sense and it's very frustrating. Yeah. And, um, 
and we're in the process of trying to figure out a way to to do it in our office for the I for hope the you're able to, patients. It's a pain in the patootie to have to deal with those because systems. we know them and we don't have to go through all that and we're just throwing the blood away so we have to just do it in red bags you know right. because it, it's a fluid from a person right so you have to do you have to dispose of it in a certain way so we are working on that okay but so, but now you've switched me from a semi-annual to a quarterly mm -hmm. dosage uh insertion mm -hmm. and since you've done that i haven't had to give away any blood right and we've found, and this isn't something I was trained with, we found that if we don't use the the six-month dose, that you don't get an increase or a, a surge of a very high level, non-physiologic level of testosterone for maybe the first month, which would trigger more blood cells. Now, I have other men who I've put on the four-month schedule, right? and we they still make a lot of red blood cells. And well, I, but there are complicating factors. It's not just the genetic piece. There are also no. some behavioral pieces yes. that we should mention. Yes. Like smoking. Like, yes. If you smoke, even yes, even cigars, for those of you who smoke cigars, that thickens your blood and gives you more red blood cells. If you live at a high altitude, you have a natural... Everybody who lives in Colorado for uh, over two months ha develops a higher level of red blood cells because the oxygen is air pressure's lo lower. Well, you have to it's the oxygen. Take the in oxygen more ox percentage exactly. is lower, so you develop more cells. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you may even develop all of your cells, like white cells and and platelets as well, uh, at that altitude. If you take a lot of vitamin C, yes, that in general is not a bad thing. But if you're on testosterone, you shouldn't be taking vitamin C if you have this issue because it stimulates the absorption of iron and it stimulates the formation of red blood cells. And then uh, hypoxia from other conditions like COPD. Right. If you have COPD where you are, um, where you are a smoker and you have damaged your lungs so much that you have trouble with exertion or you have to be on oxygen, mm -hmm. those folks have a really high count. And, and then I send them to a specialist to see if they can even take testosterone because if they have a high count and they need it to carry the oxygen around to their tissues, then I don't want to be removing blood all the time and decreasing their ability to, to carry oxygen. So then so, you have to look at what are the worst things that could possibly happen right. if you have a high count and those, the, they're, it's important, but it's also important to note that these things aren't even a risk until your count is over 55%. So at 55% and over, then almost every doctor would suggest that you get some blood removed and you decrease your dose of testosterone. Okay. So if you're 55%, you have the risk of a heart attack because the blood is so thick, you can't get it through those vessels in the heart. Not not into the chambers of the heart, but the vessels that feed the muscle of the heart. Right. And it does increase the risk of stroke. So I see older people. I mean, I'm not a doctor, and, mm -hmm. and I look around and based on the things you've taught me and say, well, I wonder if this is that or that. Mm -hmm. So I see older people that look like they have no blood in their body. They're really pale, mm -hmm. and I've learned to say, well, there's a walking heart attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, sh we were at church Sunday morning and, and talking about our church has a lot of really old people mm -hmm. wandering around, uh, and I'm getting yeah. in that group. We aren't admit, but, ever but admitting that. There's about a, a third of them that are as pale as a sheet of paper, and they move slow. Mm -hmm. They have balance issues, mm -hmm. and they don't look like they have any blood. I mean, they look like the vampires visited them last night. Well, one of the would, part, would parts of be? aging is the opposite of erythrocytosis, okay. and that is that you're, you don't absorb as much iron, you don't make as many red blood cells. You do get pale because you don't have the blood flow to the skin, but also because of the heart attack issue. If, you if your heart doesn't pump as well as it should, then all the vessels in your skin constrict so that so you don't get as much blood asking, uh, to your face. That, could that potentially be a red blood cell issue because their blood is thicker and their heart can't pump as much? No, they don't look like that when they have erythrocytosis. So what do they look erythrocytosis like? Erythrocytosis usually makes somebody's face look really ruddy, kind of reddish. Like a drunk? 
I, uh, no, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be. I haven't. I mean, I haven't looked at people and known they were alcoholics very often. You, you are currently as many alcoholics I, as I have. Yeah, you've had them in your family. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I guess that's the same look. That kind of swollen, swollen face and red, red ruddy look. Yeah, I would. I would but first assume nothing, alcohol, not blood. Right, but it has nothing to do with alcohol in okay. this case. Right. It has to do with lots of red blood cells. But you look opposite of what aging does. Age, I mean, aging and becoming frail and the loss of testosterone is pretty much the opposite of when someone's testosterone is normal or high normal and they get too many red blood cells. Okay. So they're, the happy medium is where we're, what we're shooting for, not high or low. So as a physician, if you see somebody that their, their face is reddish, almost purple, mm -hmm. and they're not just overexerted or, or they're not out tan. in the sun yeah, too much, not. Mm -hmm. then your first thought wouldn't be alcohol. It would be... It, it would be a high blood count. And okay. there's lots of other reasons you can have a high blood count. You know, then, I mean, some, some people even take iron. and Iron supplements. And in general, iron isn't indicated unless you have honest anemia. And right. you can have anemia from aging or you can have anemia because you have uh, bleeding in your intestines, which is one of the causes. Right. Of anemia, and then you need iron for a certain period of time to build your count back. But that can be dangerous in people who have high hematocrits, high hemoglobin, which is really counting the amount of iron in the in the red blood cells. So that's something that women shouldn't take iron after menopause unless a doctor prescribes it. So if it's in your vitamin, get a different kind of vitamin. And men shouldn't take iron unless they're taking it for a particular reason. But most men, since men don't have periods and don't bleed uh, monthly until, like we do, until menopause, they they have higher levels of, of um, red blood cells in general. In fact, we look at the hemoglobin hematocrit of a man, and its normal is higher than a, a, a woman mm -hmm. because women in general are losing blood all the time. Right. The same effect as just going to Red Cross and having some taken right. out. Right, right. And... and Depending on the severity of the periods, it's almost, it could be like that. So you have to, there's a surge after you have testosterone replacement mm -hmm. where the red blood cell count increases mm -hmm. for those people that are genetically suffering from mm -hmm. this. Uh, that surge is the issue of concern because mm -hmm. then you have the possibility of a stroke or a heart attack or some. If it's over other, 55%. If it's over 55%. So the most significant thing that you do once you've identified somebody has this concern is you moderate their dosage and their frequency right? as a way to... to and we take them off all the things that can cause them like to... Like vitamins that have iron right? and too much vitamin C mm -hmm. and, of course, smoking. Right. And some things we can't take them off of, like diuretics for high blood pressure. Right. If you are on a diuretic, you make your um, blood count even higher because you're dehydrating yourself. Oh, Interesting. So if you dehydrate yourself, because you're, the water that you drink is being, actually waters your blood down. Mm -hmm. It's being carried in the blood. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to not be dehydrated, not take diuretics, not get your blood drawn when you've been exercising beforehand. Mm -hmm. And when we tell people to fast before their blood tests, we can actually get a false positive, meaning they don't really have a problem. It looks like they do. If they don't drink water during that fasting period. So as a matter of fact, you recommend to people that have this condition that if they need to have a fasting blood test, they only drink water after midnight, not coffee, not some other. Well, yes. And no one should drink. If they have to have a fasting blood test, they should drink nothing but water, but water. anyway. But some people, and rightly so, say that fasting means nothing by mouth. Mm -hmm. And that's true if you're going to have surgery, nothing by mouth, unless the doctor says you can have a sip with your blood pressure medicine or something. Mm -hmm. But when you're getting your blood drawn for health tests, you should drink water mm -hmm. because if you're dehydrated, you're going to get a diagnosis you don't really deserve. So many of your red and that's cells, white cells. And scary. Yes, and, and it doesn't mean anything bad. Right. It just was the condition of the test. Right. So that's, and there are other things that change tests like your triglycerides will look really high after you work out. So if you go work out for an hour or an hour and a half and then go in for your fasting blood test and you haven't had 
you could have even had water, but your triglycerides will be high because you're breaking fat down and the fat is transported in your blood and it's transported as triglycerides. So, so we measure it that way. So that's a false positive as well. So what does a doctor call that specializes in, in blood? Is it a hematologist? A hematologist. Mm -hmm. So if I came to you to get testosterone replacement and I've been seeing a hematologist because of this issue or, mm -hmm. or some other issue, my uh, red blood cell count might be at 50 or above. Mm -hmm. Would you agree to put testosterone in me or would you need to have a, a release or a permission from the hematologist to say? I'd need a release. You'd need if a he release. was already treating you for this. Uh -huh and it was severe enough that you needed a hematologist to manage you, right. then I would need a release, and I would need to know what your blood drawing um, schedule was. Because you have, you, if you are on testosterone and you continually raise your blood count of your white, red cell count, right. then you need to be on an every two month, every three month blood draw or donation if you're low enough, but, right. but blood draw. And then you also have, we have to look at do you have enough iron? You may have enough, you may have a lot of red blood cells, but what if you don't have enough iron? So we have to look at your ferritin or your total iron binding capacity. That's another blood test to see if you have enough iron to actually take blood out of your system. Mm -hmm. You just so, sit around like a chemistry lab all day, don't you? Yeah. Measure my brain this, kind of, that. my, my brain kind of works that way. Yeah. But that's, but that's what doctors are thinking. I'm just saying out loud what doctors are thinking without talking to you about it because it's so complex right. but we're thinking oh high count now i need to know can i have him give blood because i don't know if he has enough iron in the system and if that's the case then i need a hematologist to help me because they've got then i hold all testosterone right. and send them to a hematologist but the workup when someone has high counts or a high high ferritin means you have a lot of iron in your system stored in tissues then Oftentimes, I'll send send that patient if they're severe when they come to me to right. a hematologist to well, get that's evaluated. The reason you do all the lab tests before right. somebody comes in the right. first time, mm -hmm. so you have all that in front of you. You don't. You don't and get often no surprises we ask later. we ask people before we even see them mm -hmm. to see the specialist so that we can treat them when they do come in. This well, is an issue when pe people come from all over the country. Right. So I don't want from them high to, altitude from, locations. Yeah. Or they. I don't want them to come to see me and me go. Ah, oh, you can't have. You can't have your testosterone pellets. Right. You got to see a specialist. Right. They've wasted a visit. A I could have done yeah. a, a phone consultation with them. Right. And but I, I'd much rather have all this lab sent to their specialist. Well, and the and goal at the end of the day me. isn't to put testosterone pellets in them; it's to get them healthy. Right. And so you don't these want to make them sicker. behaviors for right. helping them get healthy. Then I also have to depend on the patient to actually go get their blood drawn and du and dumped. Right. You know, because right. that's. The, it's the a phlebot schedule, the, the phlebotomy, therapeutic the therapeutic phlebotomy. phlebotomy. Right. I have to depend on the patient to do that. And we make sure in most of our patients that they've done it by checking an, uh, a CBC before we give them their pellets. So we're careful about this. Right. This is another thing that you have to be careful of when you go anywhere to get testosterone. If somebody's not really familiar with doing this or they're trying to just run you in and out, there's a chance that you'll have too high a count and then it won't be taken care of. So just be careful, be aware that you should be having a CBC, a blood count, at least once a year after your treatment has begun. And it can happen with any kind of testosterone. So you need to know that you aren't one of these people and that your counts aren't getting too high right. so that you don't have any um, real side effects this is kind of a pre-side effect. Right. So we, we want to be very careful about our patients. We send people to um, hematologists, and often the hematologists go, eh, it's not 55 yet. Don't worry about it. Yeah, so, but if you give them testosterone the next month, it might be. It might be 55. In which so. case, you would recommend a therapeutic phlebotomy. Yes. And, and have them adjust that. Mm -hmm. And it would all be okay, but you, if they're already seeing that or hematologist, then you work in consultation with right. them to, to maintain the, the proper dosage. Right. And, and if somebody walks in the door with a 55 hematocrit and has never had testosterone, there might be something else going on. And you need to find that out. And I need to find that out. So I, that's why I wouldn't treat them. Not that I can't have blood removed and give them testosterone. I want to make sure they're well. 
Right. So we're trying to make people better, healthier, uh, live longer, and safely. And so that's that's why this is an issue. And erythrocytosis could be a problem. That's right. It could be a problem, and we don't want you to have that, or we want you to be able to have it treated so you don't get the the endpoint problems with stroke and heart attack. All right. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.